Okay, welcome back. How's everyone today? Please feel free to ask questions, interrupt, and, and we'll see how it goes. <coughs> so this is the uh, part three, the last one I want to talk about, uh, the micromechanics of colloidal dispersions. And so let me first start off by reminding you of a few things. And, and the most, thing, uh, most important thing I want you to remember is uh, why these things are interesting and why they're soft. And that was because uh, the size of the colloidal particle was much larger than a solvent molecule. And so they're weaker by the factor of the size ratio cubed. That's just because the number density is less. <coughs> And the time scales are also slowed down by the same size ratio uh, because they're much bigger. And that gives us a separation of length and time scales and allows us to not worry about, allows us to make the fluid a continuum <coughs> and then only worry about the motion of the colloidal particles. Okay? And this is just a reminder again that once we do that, um, typically they're small, so the Reynolds number is small, so there's no acceleration. We just have a balance of forces. The forces are the hydrodynamic forces, and they take the form always the form of a resistance tensor, which is a function of the geometry, and then the velocities, and that gives us the force back. The thermal or Brownian forces um, um, have zero mean. They're instantaneous in time because the time scale associated with the motion of the colloidal particle is much uh, longer than that of the solvent molecules. <coughs> solvent are about 10 to the minus 13 seconds. Uh, colloidal particle micron is uh, 10 to the minus 8 seconds, so our separation of time scales. And then the important thing is that the uh, correlation of the random forces is given by the thermal energy KBT in the same drag that goes here. Okay? That's the fluctuation dissipation theorem. And so that's what <coughs> why you need to know the hydrodynamics, both for the hydrodynamic forces as well as for the thermal forces as well. And then you could have any type of inner particle or external force that you wish. I didn't talk about those things. Uh, they're important, and there are lots of different types of things. And those are the kind of forces one uses to make particles self-assemble into different structures and so on. You tune those forces uh, from some chemical means or other kinds of means in order to make particles do what you want to do. And they compete then against the uh, shearing forces and the thermal forces. <coughs> and then, just a reminder again also, um, we're going to be wor worried about particles that have not only forces and torques, but also um, can be put into linear flows. And then that uh, introduces another uh, moment of the force called the stresslet, which is important. And this is just this definition down here. It makes a nice, uh, pretty symmetric kind of matrix. And there's lots of nice properties of this matrix. It's symmetric, positive, definite, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this is a reminder to get us all back where we were. And, and unlike yesterday, all the R's are back in today. Right? I took the R's out yesterday, put them all back in for today. <coughs> okay? And then um, you can do N particles. It's just geometry again. Okay? So that's the important thing I just want to remember. All the symbol R's are Geometry, I haven't really told you how to compute all those things. If you want to know in detail, I'd be happy to tell you that uh, ad, ad, infinite, ad, ad nauseum. But just remember, it's just configuration dependent and so on. And the last thing we need to worry about is uh, the interactions are both have both long range parts, the like take is like one upon R, uh, short range, very lubrication, the very strong repulsive force, the particles are being squeezed together. And in the periodic boundary conditions for simulations, you have to worry about summing those up in a proper fashion. Okay, so we spent the first uh, lecture or two on doing those kind of things. Now I want to go on and say, okay, now we, now we, uh, some how to do that, put it in a box, simulate things. We want to compute things. So what do we want to compute? Okay, so we need to calculate the macroscopic properties. Okay, and so first of all, how are they defined, how do you compute them, and then just a reminder, we need to need to, need to know both the hydrodynamics as well as what the structure is. And so we want to compute something like a diffusivity that would involve the thermal energy and an appropriate average of some of these hydrodynamic tensors. And that average would be an average over the configurations. So it could be a situation where I might be able to do a Monte Carlo and just generate configurations in the form of an average. Or I might actually have it as a function of time and then do a time average, a number average, and so on. That's how you'd compute those kind of properties. And so I just want to tell you what <coughs> some of those things are and then show you some examples of, of what happens when you do compute those things. So. Here's a few of them. We talked a lot about the Stokes Einstein Sutherland diffusivity. That's a short time self diffusion coefficient. Again, that's a thermo <coughs> thermal energy times the average of the inverse of the resistance. And this is what you really want to do. You want to uh, sol invert the resistance to get the mobility. Just take the self terms, so alpha, alpha, add them all up, and average. And that defines the short time self diffusion coefficient. Now it was a function of concentration and microstructure for all the particles in the system. 
If you wanted to know about sedimentation, particles all falling due to gravity, for example, and I assume the gravitational force is the same in all the particles, that's also an average of this uh, inverse of the resistance, but it's a different average. You sum over all the particles in the system, not just the diagonal self particles. Okay. You might also want to do the flow through a porous medium to calculate the permeability uh, that Professor Hopper talked about to get the carmen kozani equation of s that you would have. And that's the average of the resistance tensor. Okay. And you average all the elements of that, which is different than inverting and averaging. Okay. Because in multiple particles, the inversion is not the same as what you do. Okay. So the order in which you do things uh, make a difference. So problems in the resistance formulation are different than problems in a mobility formulation. And <coughs> we can, I can tell you a lot about that if you really want to know about those things. But okay, so those are properties you might want to compute, and people have for different things and different processes. Um, and I'll show you some examples of diffusion uh, uh, later on. The other important property one wants to compute often is the uh, rheology or the stress. And so here is what the formula for the bulk stress is. This again we would be an average over all particles and over the unit cell, for example. There is the average pressure in the fluid. The fluid is incompressible, so there's some pressure. It doesn't really matter what it is, but there is always a pressure in the fluid. Twice the solvent viscosity times the average rate of strain. We talked about that a bit, the average rate of strain of the material, not just the fluid or the solid. And the particles make a contribution proportional to their number density n, and then an average of the contributions. And there are three pieces. One piece comes from the shearing motion with a rate of strain tensor E. All these symbol R's are all hydrodynamics. Every time you see me at R, that's hydrodynamics. That's all I need to worry about. That gives you the hydrodynamic stress due to shearing motion. It's proportional to the instantaneous value of the rate of strain. For those who recall yesterday, we did this dilute case. The Einstein viscosity, it lives in here. This is the tensor that couples the stress to the rate of strain. This is the tensor that couples the stress to the velocity. I multiply that by the inverse of the force and velocity. That gives me now, uh, then the U's contract. It gives me the stresslet from a force. A force times the rate of strain gives me a stresslet to the rate of strain. So that's why those crazy indices I have actually mean something. They are like summation things. You can think about that way. Also, if I have interparticle forces, um, I would get a stress associated with that. There would be the usual piece that one would always have, which would be the force moment, the XF it would call, that would Irving Kirk would have, which you have in all atomic and molecular systems, which you have in your granular systems as well. But you also have fluid motion associated with the inner particle force, and that generates a stress due to the fact that the fluid satisfies the dose of boundary conditions on the surface of the particles, generates a stress. And <coughs> just to, as a reminder, there are lots of types of inner particle forces. There could be just some steric interactions where particles are kept at a certain distance apart. We spoke a bit about that. That's a way you can tile in how much hydrodynamics you want to have. But there are all kinds of other inner particle forces that are operative and important. And they will both always influence what the structure is. And they, they have direct contributions, uh, in this case, generating their own separate contribution to the stress, directly proportional to what the moment of those forces are. If the particles have external torques on them, this is the unit alternate tension, they generate an anti-symmetric stress. That comes from torques on the particles. Okay? That's how that enters. And finally, from the Brownian motion itself, there are two pieces, the thermal energy KT to isotropic piece, plus another part, which again involves the spatial variation of these hydrodynamic functions. And that's the Brownian or thermodynamic contribution to the stress. So those are well-defined quantities, all these symbol R's. And now you know the, all, you have, all you have to do is ca calculate them somehow, put them in a warm computer, and let them bake for a while, and you can <laughs> compute all the averages that you want to have. Okay? What it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> Low temperature. Okay. So we're, we'll now I'm going to try and I can show you some results. Okay. So I can and, and, and what happens. So first thing we're going to do is uh, uh, we should be able to calculate things at equilibrium. So I'm going to take the simplest cases of just hard spherical particles, monodisperse, disperse, and and basically no uh, inner particle forces except a hard sphere exclusion, hydrodynamics, and Brownian motion. Okay. Yes? Could you distinguish the first two terms in the first one? Here? Yeah. No, in the, yeah, in the second. This and the next one. These, 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 you yeah. want to know what these R's are? No, I'm wondering how do, how do I distinguish them physically? Because you said one is a stress and strain one. The second one is RSE. 
Yes. Right. Okay. I think I can try to answer that for you. Um, okay, they're all here. This couples the stress to the rate of strain in this tensor. This gives me the, where does it go? This gives me the force from the rate of strain. This gives me the stress from the velocity. So they're all elements of this symmetric positive definite matrix. Uh, I said, okay, so what I meant by that was that those, I, I, made, up this, I made up this notation, uh, you know, and so the, it is, at least to me it tells me I did something right, but that's just me. Um, <coughs> so ultimately I want, to want this to be stress related to rate of strain. So that's stress related to restraint right away. So this too has to be stress related to rate of strain. This gives me stress to velocity. The invert gives me velocity in this side force. And so you can think of that as summation, okay? As well as you get a sum over all the particles as well. I mean, so there's a huge contraction of n particles and so on. Did that answer your question or no? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so the Stokes, no, I, the Stokes Einstein, the Einstein viscosity lives in here. A single isolated particle result lives here, okay? So for a circle particles, these guys, for a single particle, these would be zero and it only lives over there. These only enter when you have uh, more than one particle interacting with each other. For a non circle particle, you get a piece here because of the orientation that may arise associated with that. Okay? Other questions? Comments? Okay. So first thing I want to compute is, okay, so we're going to do the simplest problem of just hard spheres, uh, uh, and the first thing is just at equilibrium. Okay? And we should be able to compute the stress. So this is the equilibrium osmotic pressure. Pressure normalized with the number density thermology K Boltzmann T. It's only a function of the volume fraction down here. And on this curve shows you in red are what happens for a monodisperse case. And all I want to do is show you that the, the dashed line here is the carnahan starn equation of state for hard sphere particles. And these are computed from that formula, which involves hydrodynamic functions. The hydrodynamic functions alone will give you the hard sphere osmotic pressure because these are hard particles. The actual lubrication forces prevent particles from touching each other. You do not need any repulsive force at all. The hydrodynamics would do it for you alone. And we have explicit comparison of the calculation from what happens. If you make them bidisperse, that's the blue, and it agrees perfectly fine. So that's good. Calculate the pressure. It had better work for that. So. That's just a test to make sure that you've programmed properly. Everything works fine. Okay, <coughs> back to the where I told you to think about Brownian motion diffusion as a theme. So the rest of the theme is going to be related to diffusion. I told you about that before. And so this is just a reminder of uh, all, the, all the players, uh, Einstein, Brown, and Stokes. And the Stokes, Einstein, oh, poor Sutherland got dropped. Oh, God, I should have changed the slide. Um, and the brownie works these particles. And so um, we talked about this when was the uh, short time self-diffusion coefficient. And so I want to then uh, uh, see if we can't uh, see what that looks like. And so here's <coughs> results for monodisperse hard spheres. They're jiggling around due to Brownian motion. That's what it looks like at equilibrium, no flow. And we're plotting the uh, short time, that's just instantaneous mobility, short time self-diffusivity, normalized by the infinite dilution Stokes, Einstein, Sutherland value. It's only a function of volume concentration as a function of volume fraction on a log linear plot. Um, the solid symbols are the simulation results. Um, the open symbols are experiments. Experiments are done by light scattering for particles which range in size from about uh, 20 nanometers to about a micron or so inside. You can do a certain light scattering will give you the short time self-diffusion coefficient. And that's just thermal energy times the average of the equilibrium of the mobility of the particles. It's also known how it behaves at low concentration, how it decreases. And then it's also known now how it goes to zero. It goes to zero at random close packing, and it goes to zero logarithmically with the distance away from random close packing. <coughs> and this is a comparison uh, between the experiments which draw the open symbols and the simulations, and there's no adjustable constants uh, at all between that's a direct comparison between that. So it works okay. What is next? Oh, yes. So uh, um, if you remember, uh, there was a relationship to yeah, diffusion. I'm writing the board. There was uh, something about diffusion. 
from Stokes, Einstein, and Sutherland was D was KT over 6 pi eta A. So you might think there's a relationship between diffusion and viscosity. And so here I've told you what is how the diffusivity changes as I increase the concentration. And this diffusivity gets slowed down basically because I, I, my neighbors are all bumping around me and I can't move anywhere. And I push them and so it slows me down. And so I'll show you, as I showed you last time, this is the equivalent problem but for the rheology. This is known as the high frequency dynamic viscosity, small amplitude oscillatory, oscillatory shear flow. You can put the viscous response and that then increases with increasing concentration. Again, just for hard spherical particles, normalized by the solvent. <coughs> it also diverges at random closed packing in the logarithmic fashion. Um, and so it looks sort of, you turn your head upside down, it looks sort of like the other plot I just had a minute ago. And uh, sure enough, it works. Not exact, but for an engineer, that's plenty good. So even as a function of volume concentration, the short time self-diffusivity is equal to 1 over the high frequency dynamic viscosity as a function of volume fraction, for at least for hard spheres. So d0 self as a function of phi is a pretty good of 6 pi eta prime with quadratic prime infinity as a function of phi um, a. Okay. <coughs> right. Uh, someone asked last time for Jim about the modulus. Also, you can measure the elastic response on oscillatory flow. And I found my slide. This shows you a comparison of the high frequency modulus of hard sphere suspensions compared to some experiments as a function of volume fraction. And so that seems to agree well with the experiments also. <coughs> Sorry? You, when you, you, you put a high frequency uh, small amplitude shear flow and you measure the in and out of phase response. And one's the modulus and one's the viscosity. Okay. Um, and actually there are, there are linear response formula you can compute that. Just say the li like linear response you have for atomic and molecular liquids. There's a formula like that as well you can use to compute these kind of things. Um, <coughs> this shows you a different diffusivity. This guy here. Yeah, hmm? yeah, yeah. So that's just a fit. That's a fit. Yeah. Okay. We can, that's just to show you that if you extrapolate, that's what the, uh, the goes away. It goes high frequency diverges at random close packing for hard spheres logarithmically as you approach there. Okay. Because I understand that as far as the, uh, the any kind of uh, the constitutive relation is concerned, only empirical Krieger Doherty uh, does a good job. That's a different viscosity. That's the next one I'll talk about. Okay. okay. There's at least two viscosities. There's going to be three diffusivities, guys. Okay. So, all right. <coughs> um, so that was that. That was that. So this is a different diffusivity. This is the long time self diffusivity. Now the short time was just this guy, a little red particle. See, they're not moving. It's short time, it doesn't move at all. We talked about that last time. It's the time, it doesn't have any displacement whatsoever, and it's still diffusive. This particle now has to move and wander around. He's got to move his neighbors out of his way to get someplace, okay? And that slows it down. It doesn't go as it's more difficult to diffuse. So its diffusivity goes to zero, uh, more steeply. Well, I'll compare them to each other. This shows that the long time self diffusivity is a function of volume fraction, normalized by the infinite dilution value as a function of phi. <coughs> and it uh, crashes as in a, a log linear plot. And it goes to zero, uh, not at random close packing, but at the glass transition, where these particles get all jammed together to form a glass. Okay, because uh, once I'm in a glass, I can't move anymore. My diffusivity is essentially gone to zero, and that's a different diffusivity. That's a different question. Okay. All right. Um, and the analogous thing for the rheology is the zero shear rate, steady shear viscosity, would correspond to the long time diffusive behavior. So that's a plot of just the thermodynamic or Brownian contribution to the stress, which I showed you last time, for the zero shear rate. So steady shear, but low shear rates, low Peclet numbers. And that shows you this viscosity diverging at the glass transition. And I think the next one, yeah, this is the glass transition here, about 58% by volume. 
and that viscosity uh, for hard sphere particles diverges at that point. And this shows you then a comparison of the zero shear rate viscosity compared to one over the long time self diffusivity, and they also agree with each other. Okay? So we all, so Stokes, Einstein, Sutherland still works. If I have the long time self diffusion coefficient, it's still the thermal energy divided by 6 pi now at eta naught of phi A, where that's the zero shear rate steady viscosity. Okay, two viscosities, two diff do you understand different difficulties? Does that make sense? Okay, okay. Uh, that's good because there are three. Okay, this is a plot of diffusion just for hard shears. Uh, normalized by uh, zero uh, by the value at infinite dilution, the function of phi. The red here are the same red. That's the short time self diffusivity. Goes down. This is now just a, a, log, a, log, a linear linear plot. This is the long time self diffusivity, which you see is always less than. You can actually prove that's always less than the short time self diffusivity. But there's yet another one, which is in green, which goes up within concentration. That's the collective or down gradient diffusion of the particles. In that case, all the particles are coming collectively down the concentration gradient, and that's a different process. And that actually goes up as the concentration goes up. So how do you understand those things? I like to understand, make an analogy, so I think so we, we've all experienced this personally. So I think this is a personal analogy. So, you, so you're in a really crowded room, right? And you're bumping around all your neighbors, you can't move anywhere. That's your short time delf, delf diffusivity, right? But then you want to go to the door and you got to push everybody out of the way and it's harder to do that and so that slows you down, right? That's the difference between the short and the long time self diffusivity. The collective or gradient diffusivity, how you should think of that is the fact that you're, um, there's a banquet taking place and the doors are all closed and you're all standing outside waiting to rush in. The door is open, you go rushing in, right? right? That's the collective down gradient diffusivity. And that's given by the product of the hindered settling function which slows you down, but the driving force is the gradient of the chemical potential which increases with increasing concentration. So this one turns out that there's a part which is a sedimentation velocity which, is a, which goes, slows down the more concentrated the particles are, but the driving force goes up. That's the guys behind you pushing in when the doors are open to the buffet, right? So that actually increases with increasing concentration. I don't have three viscosity. Yeah, they aren't related. You can't relate one to the other. No. They're different physical processes. I okay. Guess you can relate the later two, right? Long time and short time? Uh, well, they have to, they're different things. They're related uh, in what fashion? I mean. Yeah, one is infinite frequency, the other one is zero frequency. Yes, in that sense. So, in the frequency response plane, they are, yes. From that perspective, just like rheology is, yes. So but the collective is different, yes. For a single particle, if you look at the time, which is like an intermediate. They're all over here, single particles here. They're all the same. Like, you know, you have a short time diffusivity in which the particle is just signaling around. Mm -hmm. You have a long time one in which you have to negotiate all of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens in intermediate time? Is it diffusive at all? Ah. So what's the transition between short and long time? Yes. Okay. So if you were to make a plot at, at time and plot the mean square displacement, for example, you would find that since we're, we're always a time long compared to the momentum relaxation, so I start off diffusive, I go like, oops, sorry, I go like this, and then I curve over to another value which is less. That's a transition between uh, uh, well, zero short and long time. They're asymptotically both diffusive. If you happen to pick something, and people will call it, they use the nasty word subdiffusive, because in this part where it transitions from short to long time, it's not growing linearly in time anymore. But that's just because you haven't waited long enough. I reserve the word subdiffusive, subdiffusive for thing which is subdiffusive at infinite time, or superdiffusive. There are lots of transition processes which you know, the curve has to go different places in different ways, right? But most people don't, aren't as picky as me. And they'll call that subdiffusive, right? So okay. Let me ask you a naive question. Please. So, the, how is this different than the shear thinning that uh, the, uh, the suspension underfoot? 
So, um, if you, um, I have a slide. I didn't put it in my talk here. I can dig one up for you. Uh, so you could ask the question, I have this transition from this behavior, and I've got this kind of stuff, and you can actually connect them uh, very closely. Nice model systems. It's not exact, but they can be lined up yes. well. In the low shear rate, you have high viscosity, high shear rate, low viscosity. That's a different thing, because those would both be, you know, those, those would be both our steady, long-time results. So you can do a Cox -Mer Mertz rule. That's a different one. Thing, yeah. Yes, that one you can do. That works. That's actually the connection. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, it's an aside for those that know what Cox Mertz is. Part personal discussion here. <coughs> anyway, but these are these are both steady long. They, these would be uh, they're different things, right? Okay. Right. What's next? Okay. So yes, please. This is this this is this is someone's theory. It's, I, I forgot whose theory that is uh, that goes through like that. It's hard to know. It, it's hard. To, the data are hard because you've got this is known. You can look up in a book what the chemical potential is. That's not hard to figure out. But to measure the sedimentation velocity, that's not that easy to do, and it's actually hard to calculate as well because. Um, in the jargon of stokes and dynamics, there's no lubrication when they're all moving together, and so uh, you have you have that nice feature that's not present. You have to do lots of work to get an accurate measure of the sedimentation velocity. So that's why there's and, and these are these are experiments, and so the experimentally it's difficult to measure. So the best bet is it goes up and then goes to a constant. Okay, theoretically it goes up. Uh, George Batcher calculated how it goes up. Okay. So at least in Einstein, where the Einstein's rule is applicable. Same? Everybody's the same. What about bachelor and what about grad? Sorry? Who's what? When you go from Einstein to bachelor. Yeah. And then bachelor to Brady. How does it? Uh, bachelor to Brady? What does that mean? <laughs> you came with the five cube. Uh, Oh, I know, I know. Who knows? But no, the, 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 these are not known. Uh, I, I don't think anybody knows the next coefficient uh, phi square. You know, calculation-wise, we know simulation-wise, yes. But so, this we haven't calculated this. This is hard calculation by Stokes Dynamics because there's no lubrication, so it doesn't work well. So that's not we can. We have a hard time getting that well. Okay. Other questions? It's basically sedimentation. It's where all the products moving collectively together, and then the solvent is going back in the opposite direction. Okay, and then when you work out what the driving force for that motion, it's the driving force of the chemical potential is the driving force for that motion. So that's where this comes from. So, uh, so why? So it's like advection, all moving down. Yes, in that sense. Well, it's proportional to the gradient of something, so it is. Yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Now I want to take you down a road of <coughs> diffusion. Okay. So, I said what I think about just the kinematically about uh, diffusion. Diffusion is a uh, velocity fluctuation squared times the correlation time. For our Brownian particle, the, the velocity fluctuation is just the kinetic energy divided by the mass. Correlation time is the momentum relaxation time, and that gives you, with a factor of three, the right answer for the Stokes, Einstein, Sutherland diffusion coefficient. Just doing that. Nothing else. And then, as I told you before, for uh, example, for a particle of size uh, a half a micron, it takes a, a second to diffuse its size. Okay, take, that's sort of what the colloidal regime is. And so, if you uh, and and if you imagine if it, if it's concentrated, it takes you know uh, ten or a hundred seconds for that one micron sized particle to diffuse of order its size, right? Because it's going down. So, so if you stop and think about it for a moment, and let's just ask ourselves about uh, the time to diffuse my size, and this is uh, the lowest estimate. It should be much slower in a concentrated system. A second or a half micron, a thousand seconds for five microns, it's 30 years for 500 microns, right? So at a uh, big particle, this isn't going to be important for their diffusion, right? So so, so then the question comes about, if I imagine I'm shearing these, is there another mechanism which can give rise to diffusive motion that's not associated with the thermal fluctuations, 
but rather we're associated with the interactions amongst the particles because they're being sheared. So if I shear them at high shear rates, high Peclet numbers, so the shear rate's large compared to the Brownian diffusion, then just velocity fluctuations go like, uh, velocity is the shear rate times particle size, that and the time scale is one over the shear rate, that predicts a diffusion, if it, if it exists, as the shear rate times particle size squared, okay? Just by dimensional arguments. And so the question, um, if I do this for these low Reynolds number flows, will it diffuse or not? Okay, so that's the question. And um, why is that a question? Um, it's a question because uh, we know there's reversibility in Stokes flow. So here is the G.I. Taylor film, which we will now play. I think I'll turn the volume up so you can hear G.I.'s voice. So this is a similar but play different, same film, but slightly different part than what uh, Herbert showed earlier today. So I always think you can never go wrong showing a G.I. Taylor film in a talk, right? That's always a good thing to do. Low Reynolds number flows are those in which inertia plays only a very small part in the conditions which determine the motion. Here are two concentric cylinders. <coughs> the fluid can be moved by turning the inner cylinder with this handle. The annulus between them is filled with glycerine. Into this space, I introduce some dye, which stays put owing to the high viscosity of the glycerine. Note its position before I start turning it. I now turn it four times, pushing the handle clockwise. The dye seems to mix as a drop of milk mixes when it is stirred into a cup of tea. There you go. So Stokes flow is reversible. So now the interactions amongst these parts, these are just hard sphere particles, neutral boiling the fluid, nice, perfect, round, smooth spheres with just Stokes flow, no brown motion, no interparticle forces. And so we got this notion of reversibility. So if you shear it one direction, then they should all come back again. And so that would sort of suggest I can't get this diffusive random process taking place. Question? So it's a pure fluid This is, yes. How do you, why, why not? Because, uh, I mean, like, if we take just two particles, Two particles, we'll come back. So I'll show you. Okay? So, yes, please. Didn't Herbert show us a low Reynolds number flow that was not reversible? Did you, Herbert? What's a low Reynolds number? <laughs> you gotta wink at me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. So, um, so I'm going to leave it to you. So, so I'm going to. I decided that the best way to decide whether it's diffusive or not is um, uh, to take a vote. Okay. So, so I'm going to show you results of some simulations in which one set, one set of simulations are both at 35 percent by volume, low Reynolds number. One's at infinite Peclet number, no Brownian motion. Uh, low Brownian motion. One's pure Brownian motion, no flow. Okay. Now, so you so to not so that you don't see the advective motion and the shearing motion, I'm going to show you the picture where you're looking down the flows coming at you. And I'm just going to show you the center of one particle at slices in time. Okay, you're just going to see a strobe of the particle center appear as a function of time. All right, and your job, and we're going to take a vote, is to decide which one is pure Brownian motion, which one's got no Brownian motion whatsoever. Okay, so there they go. We're just recording the center of one particle. All right. Well, they'll stop in a second. What, what you can, we'll all vote. We'll all get to vote. Okay. Don't let him bias your opinion. Okay. And he's the first. 
All right, so how many say run A is per Brownian motion? You want to take a vote? How many say run B is per Brownian motion? Okay. How many say you can't tell? <laughs> That's the right answer. You can't tell. <laughs> you can't tell. Okay. And now I'll show you the same thing again. I don't remember which one is which, honestly. Uh, but now I'll show it at, at a shorter time interval. Okay. Now you see this one. At the short time, you actually see the determinist trajectory of the one particle. This is Brownian at any time you look at it because it's always Brownian motion. Okay? So at short times, it's not the, the, the trajectory are deterministic, but at long enough time, it's a random walk process again with just the normal kind of diffusion induced by the shearing motion instead. Okay? So that was what was interesting. It's called shear induced diffusion. And um, when I was visiting. You, I, I'm saying that you see this motion here, this trajectory. You see, that, you see this is, it's not just random spots, which is Brownian. This is a continuous curve. If you take the second moment, probably it would be much more clear. <coughs> the second moment in terms of x squared. Mean squared is I like dots on a okay. thing. If I did, if I did, if I did, if I did finer time, you'd just see a continuous path of this particle. Where this, no matter how fine you describe it, it's just hopping. That's what Brownian motion means. Okay. So um, uh, people were trying to do some experiments, and so this is from uh, several years ago. Uh, uh, David Pine was at Santa Barbara. Jerry Gobb was visiting him. There was a uh, sabbatical, and there was a KITP program that I came by, and Jerry and I shared an office together, and it's my graduate student, uh, Lashansky. So Dave Pine and Jerry did the experiments, and I and Alex did the simulations. And so uh, what the, well this is going to be G.I. Taylor's experiment. We're going to do the experiment G.I. Taylor did. Go forward and come back, okay? Reverse the flow. These are about 20 to 30 percent by volume uh, particles, nuclear boiling suspended in a fluid, some of which are been dyed black. Okay? So there are a lot more particles than you see, and so it's more, much more concentrated than what you see in that image. And then the experiment is going to go just as you to go to the right, come back again, take a picture. Go to the right, come back again, take a picture. Take a picture just when I return to where I started from again. Okay? And they're going to do one thing at small strain amplitudes. Time doesn't matter, Stokes flow. So just how far, what strain you have, and large strain amplitude. So here's the small strains, and you see little tiny jiggling, right? So this is the lots. I come back, I take a picture of the particles, we come right back to where they started. Completely reversed. And small. We'll, we'll I'll, I'll quantify small for you in a moment. Okay, and you see the background is still moving. The same thing, and they don't. Now it undergoes the random walk process. Okay? And you can quantify that by these are systems are have deterministic chaos. Okay? That is, uh, two trajectories close together will diverge exponentially in time if the strain is large enough. Okay? So it's important to remember that although there's a linearity in Stokes flow between velocity and force and so on, that resistance matrix is a very nonlinear function of configurations, not linear in the configurations, highly nonlinear system. Only special cases like those fancy dancing spheres I had would actually be periodic. Most systems are not. They have chaos and they lose memory. And so here it shows you we can compute from the simulations what the up and off exponent is by actually watching trajectories diverge. And if you're at a small strain amplitude less than one, essentially no divergence, then you go off and in the strain of uh, uh, three, you're now blowing far apart. And so that becomes a diffusive-like behavior <laughs> due to the deterministic chaos of this highly nonlinear dynamical system. Can Please? Can you Say again? Can you predict any of that theoretically or just measure it? Uh, just measured it. You can predict the Yelp off exponent. You can predict, you can do some simple theories to predict the Dirut limit of the diffusion coefficient. Okay, but that, the up and off exponent, um, no. You know, a strain of one is when I've gone, I run another particle, so, you know, that's sort of, you would expect that a uh, strain of order unity, you'd start to get into trouble. So that's about exactly where it happened. And this is, I forgot what, this must be about 30% by volume, maybe 20% by volume. It, it might shift if you change the concentration. It might be lower strain at higher concentrations and higher strain at lower concentrations. I have to find my neighbor 
So at low concentration, I have to straighten larger, to, and I could have a larger window reversibility at, at smaller concentrations. Yes? What about the crossover strain? Say again? What about the crossover strain? Can you predict that? Um, yeah, we do, have a, we, do have a, we do have a prediction. I do. I've forgotten what it was, but I, it's in the paper. I remember that now. Yes. <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, we did. Yes, I have forgotten. <laughs> I think... I think it goes like 1 over phi squared, I think is what I remember for that. I need two bodies to interact, so I think it's like 1 over phi squared. So, so that's what would diverge like that. I think that's how it goes. But I'll, uh, I'll look it up for you and report back to you uh, tomorrow. Okay? Yes? Correct. There's still, there's still linear force and velocity, still linear relationship. I double the velocity, double the force. But the configuration it means the evolution, because don't forget the position is the time derivative of the position is the velocity. So, uh, so you know the velocity. So the simplest case is you've got, you know, uh, simplest case I've got, you know, r times u equals a force, right? So u equals that, and then dx dt equals r of x inverse f, and that's a highly nonlinear function, right? So. Yeah, right. So that's why I asked the question like, when we put a suspension, it is uh, like having this kind of uh, highly nonlinear configuration. Right. And then we add this die and then do this experiment. If the particle positions are moving very randomly, how can we assure that the die comes back? Well, it, it, one of these particles is a die. Right. So the die would never come back, of course. Right. If I go a small enough strain, the die would come back as well. If the particles came back, right? So if you're if if the particles come back, the die is going to come back with them. A small strain. Yeah, for a large strain, the particles don't come back. The die doesn't come back either. That is, the fluid doesn't come back, right? That's all the die is measuring what the fluid is doing. Fluid. The, if you think about the uh, if I tied if I dyed a pack of fluid, its diffusion coefficient would be just proportional to the diffusion coefficient of the particles because every time a particle hops one way, equal volume of fluid has to hop the other way, right? So. So you can figure out the diffusivity of a molecular tracer in the solvent would have its Brownian diffusivity plus this enhanced convective diffusive motion from the particles. And that's actually important for transport of small solutes and, and things in, in blood flow, for example, because the blood is, the particles are creating diffusive motion of themselves and the fluid has to diffuse in the same fashion that enhances the transport to what you would uh, estimate. But uh, uh, there, there reaches a steady state, so I, I don't have to. Once I've strained here, uh, I don't going further doesn't help me at all. I'm now diffusive, and once you're diffusive, it doesn't matter anymore. But, uh, in the sense that uh, when the amplitude of strain is large, the diffusion has been increased. Right, but 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 it doesn't keep going. It doesn't keep going, but that is not the same feature in the fluid. So he went through four terms. That was pure fluid. Correct. Right. Right. But my point is that the, a packet of fluid in this thing would diffuse just like a particle. Right. It's not going to come back. Particles come back. <coughs> yeah. It's got to go. As I said, if a particle hops here, the fluid piece had to hop there. So if particles diffuse, the fluid has to diffuse. Right. So there's no other option. And this just shows you comparison of the measured uh, values in black um, in the. Um, in the vorticity direction, and it says flow direction, I don't believe that. It must be in the velocity gradient direction, in the vorticity direction, compared to what um, we computed by the numerically. And they, they, they agree fairly well. It's very low with small strain amplitudes, and then it uh, grows, and you saturate some value at high enough strain amplitude. Okay. <coughs> okay. So, shear induced diffusion exists. Um, and um, so, we then uh, uh, had fun uh, doing that. So, these are some results of showing now the Peckley number dependence at a particular volume concentration, a steady shear flow of the diffusivity normalized by uh, Stokes, Einstein, Sutherland as a function of the non-dimensional shear rate in three different directions, um, the vorticity direction, the velocity gradient direction, and the flow direction as well. And you see there's no change in direction, so it's isotropic. Diffusive, even though the flow is very non-isotropic, the diffusivity is. 
and you transition from basically being the long time self diffusive behavior, it's less than one, right, because they're high concentration, to now growing linearly with the shear rate, so it has to scale differently, like gamma dot a squared. Okay, so that's what you should expect to happen. It does seem to behave that way. And here's a compare. This is 45% by volume. Now I'm going to compare results, uh, experiment, go measure this. Um, this is the uh, shear induced diffusion in the velocity gradient direction, normalized by the shear rate to particle size squared as a function of the volume concentration. Op uh, for for um, these are all experiments, uh, Eckstein et al. a long time ago, uh, Leighton and Akrobos, Fan and Leighton, Bredfield, and then two sets of simulation results, and that's what they look like. It goes up as the concentration goes up and then sort of saturates over at some value. Um, I should point out that in the, um <coughs> in the experiments, they vary the particle size and vary the shear rate. And so the data all collapse, if you call that a collapse, uh, according to gamma dot a squared. Okay? So I'd like to be the judge of the collapse of that. So that's, that's what happened. Um, we did it twice because we're really far away from all these measurements, and particularly uh, Victor Biedfeld's measurement. He did very nice long time measurements of this diffusivity, and so we were quite uh, off uh, by a bit, and so that puzzled us for a while. And so, so I want to tell you why we're off, and that is um, here, are, here are uh, Victor Biedfeld's experiments of the mean square displaced in the y direction as a function of strain, gamma dot times t. Those are his data at a volume fraction of 20%. And those are our simulations, which would go right through all of his data. Okay. And he put a straight line to that data as a good, you know, if you're doing an experiment, you know, you've got to wait some, some strain, and you put your line, that's the diffusivity that you measure. Okay. That's what he reported. Um, if you actually can do simulations and wait longer, it looks like that. Experimentally, he, would, he could not go to longer times or longer strains just because the limitations of the experiments, but we could in the simulations, and uh, that you're not at long time limit yet. You have to wait longer in order for it to turn over. So the diffusivity we report is then going to be less than what's reported at this short time, this transition from different behaviors. They couldn't do the experiment for longer times just because of the limitations of the experiments, but you can always do the simulations for shorter times. It's easier to do. So we did it for shorter times, and so if we do them for short strains, uh, then we get an agreement with what they measured experimentally. Okay? So we can do that by simulation easily. <coughs> and so that says that's good. So that's what happens. So this shear and diffusivity, and then the important, important uh, thing to point out is that in contrast to the diffusivity at no shear, which is a decreasing function of concentration, the shear induced diffusivity is an increasing function of concentration. Because I need to collide with my neighbors to diffuse. So rather than hindering my behavior, the more particles are, the more collisions I have, the faster I diffuse, the more diffusivity I have. Okay? What's happening beyond point four? Uh, it seems to saturate. Um, you have to, um, the error bars get large. I haven't, we haven't looked at this in a long time. Um, these are at fixed shear rate. So we're forcing the material to continue to flow. It's a different question if you did a fixed stress. They may not flow any longer. Okay? So those are important questions. But in this, th in this representation, you're they're always going to diffuse no matter how, how high the volume fraction is. Okay? I, I require increasingly uh, driving force to, to keep them to move. Okay? Point four is not really a no, point four is not hard. No, point four is not hard. Yeah. So, but I, I don't think it's going to go down again. It's not because here they're being forced to flow. right? And so uh, it's not like it's not like it's being jammed and hindered together because of the way it's done. It'd be a different question if I did a fixed stress, and then the whole stuff could stop, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's just a summary. Um, uh, this guy goes down at this is size scale as going up in size. So I want you to remember the long hand diffusivity is it goes like one over the size for Brownian systems, and for um, high Peclet numbers, it goes in size squared, it, and it increases with concentration. So it scales differently with the size, which is important, and depends differently upon the volume fraction, depending upon what regime you're in. Okay. I have no time. Well, I think I'll be in good time today. So, um, <coughs> what's next? Right. So that was the Brownian scaling. So, so, so before, before the desk, I yep. Message from your previous people's slides is 
the uh, irrespective of the direction of shear rate, the self diffusion coefficient is uh, same in all Correct. directions. Correct. So long hand self diffusivity, yes, right? And uh, the, the I don't know, but for some totally kind of the after reading literature, I always thought shear induced diffusion is when you have shear rate gradient. We'll come to that. Okay. We're getting there. Okay. Um, Brownian motion, shear induced diffusion. I'm going to make a quick uh, thing into granular flows, which Jim knows very well. So, in a granular gas kinetic theory, the velocity fluctuations are like the granular temperature. I don't know if we. And time scale is the mean free path divided by the mean of the fluctuating velocity. The granular temperature goes, it's, a, it's kinetic, it's gamma dot a squared to shear rate. So, that suggests the diffusivity goes like the mean free path times the square of the granular temperature, it's gamma dot a times the mean free path. Okay, so let's see what happens if we now do this. Uh, and so, um, so I'm, I'm lazy, and so all I did was throw away Brownian motion and put inertia back into Stokes and dynamics. I'm lazy. I free freely admit my laziness. Okay. And so um, what we did before was no inertia and no running motion. That was the infinite packing number limit. Now we just add the inertia of the particles back in. Um, same, same drag, same high dynamics, all the same stuff. Um, now we add, I uh, have a uh, coefficient of restitution when particles could actually collide now elastically. So I have two dissipation mechanisms, one from inelastic collisions and one from the viscosity of the fluid. Okay? And um, then now what's important is the Stokes number. The inertia of the particles is an important uh, f uh, thing. And you throw the in a warm computer and bake for a while. Correct. And there are now with inertia. With inertia it's not impossible. With inertia they can come in kind of like in finite time. So yep. You can. Um, so this shows you the, diff these are simple shear. So it's diffusivity in the velocity gradient direction normalized by gamma dot a squared is a function now of Stokes number. One concentration of 40% for various coefficients of restitution. If the inertia is not important, the coefficient of restitution doesn't matter either. It's the viscosity of the solvent is the dissipative mechanism, right? Once I go to, and the transition seems to be about Stokes number of 10, where I transit over into the granular type regime. And then the value depends upon the coefficient of restitution. Uh, if I have no coefficient of restitution and different scaling, all those things emerge. And in the granular limit, that's perfectly well known. These are what the predictions are for what the diffusivity should be from Savage and Day. And those are what these lines are from that, which agree perfectly well with what we see from the simulations. Okay? But, and then you can ask a question of, uh, as I vary the concentration, then you get something which splits between um, low Stokes numbers, it's viscous, where it's an increasing function of concentration, to high Stokes numbers, where it's now a decreasing function of concentration because the dependence of the mean free path on the density of the particles. The diffusivity actually goes down in this fashion for high Stokes numbers with concentration. So I've just blown your mind with all these possibilities. So uh, there, 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 this is what happens. So I go from Brownian to non-Brownian, from wet to dry. Um, the, these are how things scale. And that's, this goes down as phi goes up, this goes up as phi goes up, this goes down as phi goes up for high Stokes numbers. Okay, so you're supposed to remember all that now in your head in terms of what happens. So, okay. Uh, what comes next? Okay, here's the last thing I want to leave you with, um, which is what uh, we were asked a moment ago. <coughs> so, So, now usually diffusion uh, smooths out concentration variations and makes it more homogeneous. That's how we think of diffusion, right? And things mix associated with that. But, but, our diffusivity in the shear induced regime is proportional shear rate to particle size squared times some function of volume concentration. If the shear rate varies in a flow, then you will get concentration variations as a result of this. This is the migration due to shear induced diffusion. Um, what comes next? Right. And so let's see if that happens or not. So these are some examples of uh, pipe flow by Jim Gilchrist at Lehigh. 
uh, with non-branded particles. They're roughly uh, maybe about 10 or 20, they're about 10 nanometer, 10 microns in size in a pressure-driven flow. And well, it's hard to see here, but you look at the density variation. If I pump them down a, a do plazoa flow down a, down a tube, I think these are in a channel, they're maybe in a tube, the particles will eventually accumulate at the center, and this just shows you what it looks like. Um, in this region down here, they're higher density here than there is density near the wall. And that's just showing the particles going down um, this channel. They've all, the particles have spontaneously migrated to the middle of the channel, and I'm going to explain why they do this from this shear induced diffusion perspective. Okay? But this is not self diffusion, this is gradient diffusion? Yes, we'll see that. Okay? Absolutely. I'm looking over there to see what comes next. Like, okay, yeah. And so <coughs> there are also some experiments by Lyon and Leo who measured uh, the same thing. They measured the, this is the same problem. Um, particles are, are at, were at 40% by, 35%, 30% by volume. They spontaneously migrated to the middle. They measured the concentration profile. They measured the velocity profile of the particles. It's not, it's blunting of the profile and so on because the concentration is higher. They also measure the fluctuational motion of the particles in this pressure driven flow of non-Brownian particles. So there's a very simple way um, to uh, explain why they do this, um, and that is um, this. So let's imagine now we have a channel, some separation H, throw in a bunch of particles of radius A, and we're going to pump it down the channel. Steady 1D flow. Okay. So for a steady 1D flow, the momentum balance tells me that there's no variation in the stress in the Y direction. That's true for any material, gas, liquid, solid, mixture, doesn't matter what it is, just steady 1D flow, Cauchy's equation, the stress is a constant. Okay? Every plane, the Y component of stress is the same. Now we'll do dimensional analysis. The parameters we have are the particle size, the gap spacing H, the volume concentration, the solvent viscosity, and a measure of the shear rate for the pressure driven flow. Okay? And that tells you immediately that um, the all stresses scale right the solvent viscosity, the shear rate, and some non dimensional function of volume fraction, and in this case, it'd be also the size ratio of the particle to the gap spacing. Okay? And then you remember what we saw last time that as a function of shear rate, right, the pressure varies in this fashion, and if you must maintain a constant pressure across the gap, as you must from the mechanical balance, that's a constant line here. If the shear rate varies across the gap, then so too must the particle concentration to keep the stress fixed. That's all there is to it. So the particles migrate to the middle. It doesn't matter that they're rigid, they can be rods, they can be droplets, they can be the red blood cells in your blood vessels. Just from this point of view, they have to migrate to the middle. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you go back to the previous slide, even that also explains uh, this diffusivity proportional to gamma dot. Means that the diffusivity will be more in the high shear rate region, less in the low shear rate region. So obviously, there is a bit diffusivity away from. Right, you can think of it that way, but there is a, well, come to a caveat associated no, with that, right? Okay. Yeah, there, there is a, there's a caveat associated with that, okay? We'll come, we'll come to that. So particles go to the center, okay? So you're anticip he's anticipating me, he's two sides ahead of me all the way along here. We'll come to that because there's a point I want to make at that point, so like remind me, okay? Any other questions on this? So they spontaneously in the experiments? They do, okay? Well, the experiments have gone away. What comes next? Okay, so now I'm going to try to uh, think about how can we model this without doing simulations. We did do some simulations. Uh, Here? Okay, yeah. so the stress is the constant. Yeah. This is stress as a function of shear rate for different concentrations. We walk along a constant line. If the shear rate varies, then the concentration has to vary to keep the stress constant. But your stress, of course, has a problem at points where the ga gamma dot is zero. Sure. Or if it's constant, it's zero. No. Well, is not the shear rate zero in the center line of your flow? It can be, yes. Well, I, by symmetry, I think it ought to be. Yeah. But right. And, and doesn't your relation between sigma y, y, and gamma dot then indicate that the pressure sigma y, y is zero on the center line? Uh, the, the, you have to have a non-local effect due to the finite particle size to have that taken into account. 
This, so this, this is sigma y y is zero as you've written it, but you need another effect. No, this could go to infinity. Okay. That's what happens if you do a local model. The volume fraction goes to infinity at the cusp of the center line. So you mean kappa p goes to zero or goes to infinity? Correct. The pressure, the, these guys do diverge at maximum packing. That's the so mu. You're saying the, that the volume fraction on the center line is always random closed packing. This is what this simple thing would suggest. Yes. Okay. Okay. Is still uh, used migration uh, isotopic, like in the diffusion? Will it, uh, for example, if, you, <coughs> if the diffusion is happening, if the gradient, uh, gradient uh, the shear rate gradient, shear rate is in gradient direction, the variation of shear rate is in gradient direction. Will it happen at the same rate as compared to the gradient being in vorticity direction? We'll get to that. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Um, so you can do a simple model, and I'm going to write down a, a, a model, uh, not unlike what uh, Jim talked about, except I'm going to write a model for a, a balance of the total mixture that I call the suspension. That is particles plus the fluid, and that just has the usual Cauchy's equation, incompressible. And then a balance law for the particles, which would have a nice use momentum balance for the particle phase stress. And then a drag associated with the particle velocity relative to the suspension average velocity with the same symbol R we have. And then a conservation equation for the concentration of the particles. Okay? And if you just, I'm going to not worry about inertia, so left hand side will be zero. And then you can just substitute this equation to get ooh, nothing. To get the balance law then for the concentration is uh, driven by stress gradients of the particle phase. So it's stress induced diffusion. That's how you should think about it. Okay? Just that momentum balance? Sorry, what, what have you done? You, you no inertia. Yeah. I solve for this and put it into that. That's that's all I did. And it just stares at you. This is convection. This is diffusion. It's stress-induced diffusion. Okay? And so uh, is that uh, correct or not? And so that's what I just wrote down again. So there's one thing that we do know. At an equilibrium suspension, the particle stress at equilibrium is just minus the osmotic pressure. You substitute it in this equation, and that's the collective down gradient diffusivity, and that tells you that's equal to the product of the sedimentation velocity and the gradient osmotic pressure with respect to volume fraction. For those that know thermodynamics, there's a connection between chemical potential and pressure, and that's the right thermodynamic connection. So this gives you back what you'd expect for thermodynamics. Okay? So it's really driven by gradients of the osmotic pressure. Right, I think that's what comes next. <coughs> right, so then we need a constitutive model, so that's what we have. And so the model for the mixture is just the fluid and the solvent and then the particles. And the particles, we've talked about that the last few days, they have a pressure, which functions concentration and shear rate. There's a viscosity. And they may have normal stress differences as well. And so uh, do they? Um, they do. Here's some experiments done by uh, Zaraga et al. and by Kalon. You know that if you take a rod and a viscoelastic fluid, you get rod climbing. You do that in a suspension of particles, and the interface goes down <coughs> instead of going up. Rod dipping instead of rod climbing. And that's just from that, you can actually measure some combination of the normal stresses in suspensions of particles, and they give you a rod dipping. For polymers, you stress the polymer, polymer molecule in this direction, you know, the curve streamlines that develop the hoop stress, which causes the stuff to come in and go up. For repulsive particles, which these are, where you try to bend them around, they want to go the other way, and so that's why it goes down. It's not as dramatic as it is for viscoelastic fluids, but nonetheless, there are normal stress differences that go on. And they make a difference. Okay, so there were some experiments. You might do an experiment, a parallel plate and a conum plate. Now, on a parallel plate, the um, shear rate is a linearly increasing function of radius. Conum plate, the shear rate is constant. So, for a shear-induced diffusion due to the shear rate, 
then you would expect migration here from high shear rates to low and no migration here from because the shear rate's constant. The exact opposite occurs in the experiments. In the parallel plate, there's no migration. In the Conan plate, there is migration. So it's not as simple as just the shear rate. You have to, it's really stresses. And when you work out the stresses that take place, then there is a condition which you cannot hardly see of the condition on the normal stress differences such that there be no migration. And that condition is satisfied in the case of the parallel plate. It's not satisfied in the case of the conan plate. And so you get migration to the center in the conan plate. So it's really more appropriate to think about a stress-induced diffusion than a shear rate-induced diffusion. And that hopefully answers your question about different directions. You really need to look at this momentum balance perspective uh, and because when you have curved streamlines, things are different. Okay, I think I'm almost done. Uh, I don't know why that came up again. Oh yeah, so we did some calculations uh, and this just shows you a comparison of doing this model uh, with experiment in a eccentric journal bearing of what the predictions of this model would give you. And oh, I should go back. I know why it's here. So the idea is that by experiment or simulation in a homogeneous flow, you tell me these rheological functions, you tell me this function here, and you try to predict what's going to happen from those measurements in the inhomogeneous flow. That's what you want to try to do. And so that's what we did here in this eccentric journal bearing. Um, this shows you these are experiments which are done to measure the volume fraction, and this shows you comparison. You know, it's not a quantitative one, but at least a qualitatively they give you a similar kind of uh, behavior. Um, in the pressure driven flow, that's what these solid lines are. Uh, that's a best fit to the experiment. And you notice the volume fraction isn't infinite at the center line. You actually find a finite value. The simplest theory would predict a spike at the center line. You have to bring in a fi the finite size of the particle and make a non local theory to be able to make sure this thing goes around. And any small amount will do that for you. That's how you get a, that's, that's what's appropriate for that situation there. So you created a non-local theory. Yeah. 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 However, I worry about you're raising the order of the differential equation. In more complicated situations, you might have to struggle for boundaries. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I have, we have a, a, a slight advantage uh, over the granule that, that is pretty sticky at the walls because there's a lot of fluid there. And so our conditions, are, we just use no slip of the walls. We, no one's really investigated so carefully. Don't you need higher gradients as well? Because you use the continuity equation to take another derivative of the stress divergence? It's still, um, you don't have to solve it that way, so no. Okay, maybe yeah. not. You could solve the, I, you, don't you don't have to do that. You could solve this, right? Okay, yeah. I say the right hand side of that. I understand that. Me I know, I know, I understand. You're, you're absolutely right, but, it, but you, you can solve this equation and then do that, right? But it, you, mathematically, you're correct. You do have the same character to worry about those things for sure, absolutely, right? And um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, so I'll just leave you with the uh, final two thoughts. So I have this old picture of, um, you know, w here's your particle scale size, and you want to do some simulation method. Where do you choose what to do? And so if you're down here at angstrom or nanometers, you do molecular dynamics, right? Because that's what they are. Once you up the size, then that's what we talked about. And here are the scalings for these kind of things. You switch to a regime where you might as well treat the solvent as a continuum, right? And then this is, uh, you know, done to emphasize what I do. So there's a large space in this regime space in which the Reynolds number is small, um, uh, the Peclet number can be arbitrary, and you can make the Stokes number arbitrary. That's the Stokes dynamics regime. Particles get too big, of course, then the inertia of the particle is now, the inertia of fluid is no longer important. You then transit at large particles over to the granular flow, or if you have bubbles, you do bubble dynamics as well. That gives you an idea of, of where you sit, so you have to pick whatever problem you worry about and think about what might be the right appropriate uh, uh, region to do that. And the last thing I want to leave you with a picture of um, the same kind of idea, but in a different portrait way. One axis is Stokes number, one axis the Reynolds number, that is the fluid particle inertia, one axis inverse of the Peclet number. So out here is Brownian motion, out there is no Brownian motion back at the origin. Okay? And so that's what Stokes dynamics was all about. No Reynolds number along this axis. And this is kind of uh, phenomena we're thinking about. Um, 
if you ask yourself, you know, well, what if I'm down here, but uh, do I have any part fluid inertia, for example, okay? Um, then there's a criteria where um, this is basically the Schmidt number. You can't get materials with lots of Brownian motion with lots of inertia. That doesn't happen, okay? So there's a, a region where this is just not accessible. You've got the space in here. Um, the other limit that's uh, basically is granular flows. You're basically no fluid. You over here high inertia of the particles, and that's uh, over that region over there. Um, and you know, I just showed you there's also a region where, again, you can't get down there a Schmidt number, but modified by the density ratio. It's not relevant physically. You're in this space here. And I talked to you about um, what we just did was that. You can easily connect by just adding the inertia back to the equation of motion. And then uh, bubbles live up here. Density of the particle is much less than a fluid. Um, there's lots of space over here where there's no current real uh, kind of methodology to do those kind of things. So thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Questions? Question. Yeah, please. So what are the open problems? <laughs> good question. Where are people um, so that's a very good question, Jim. So I think um, one is, um, you know, these are all spheres, and uh, people can do bias for spheres to making more complicated objects. Um, that's hard to do all the high dynamics properly. I think the new, for the simulation, the new techniques that um, particularly Jim Swan is now you can now afford to make composite particles and have enough degrees of freedom to make things. So th I think there's now an opportunity to do something interesting in that kind of regime. Um, the modeling at the end, you know, we wrote this down a long time ago, no one has done much with them at all. So there's a whole uh, business about doing that. Um, you could have, I could have used the mu i rheology in this instead, which we have not investigated. That might be interesting to think about um, that, just like one has in the, in the granular, dry granular flow things. There's also the connection between the wet and dry. Um, you know, a lot of the phenomena are very similar, um, maybe different values of stuff and so on. So I think there's lots of room to to think about uh, how are they are connected together. Um, no one that I'm aware of has really studied the boundary conditions that we would need to have for these kind of viscous flow problems. Um, they just haven't gotten around to do this kind of stuff. So um, there's, and then I think other ones are unsteadiness. You know, what's the transient development and so on? What happens when you try to do those things? Um, no one's done much work in those kind of problems at all. Uh, what happens? Do, do these things still work? Or are you missing some phenomena? Because uh, you might not, you know, a simple shear flow, simple kind of problems, it can be very forgiving. You get good results and everything looks good and fine. It's not until you try some more complicated geometry or some other transient that you understand that you're missing something fundamentally in what goes on. Those have not been investigated in this kind of area as well, right? Then there's a whole other business in small particles and self-assembly and stuff like that where these simulation things are important, but that's, uh, they're not the flow kind of stuff. Thanks. Other um, questions? Yeah. Coming to the boundary condition, yeah. the tensor derived with, you know, from fluid mechanics equation with certain boundary conditions. I think the open boundary conditions. Mm -hmm. Now, if the boundary was not like that, if the boundary was different, mm -hmm. like it's a channel or something, then the tensor would also be different. Well, that's a, so I think that's the utility of formulated in terms of uh, usual continuum balances that you now know how to put them in a proper coordinate system and so on, right? And so, you know, when you, if you think back when you measure the viscosity of a fluid, you measure it in some simple uh, uh, coet kind of device, you take that same structure, that the value that you got, and you, t you do some complicated flow, right? That's crazy. So here you'd like to do the same kind of thing. I want to characterize it in this uh, some simple kind of geometry and hope to use that same function I got in a more, much more complicated flow where you have now not just shear, you got sheared extension and so on and so forth. And that's an open question as to um, will that work or not? Okay, that's an open question. Let alone what are the appropriate boundary conditions for that kind of situation. Balancing Reynolds and Stokes going to zero, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have a shear thickening, shear thickening uh, behavior and then followed by shear thickening mm -hmm. behavior. How does this get affected if we have finite particle inertia? Or, or like as the particle inertia continues? Because there you showed that in the final graph, uh, there is a regime where you can actually see the Stokes and Stokes and Stokes and Stokes and 
changes. Right. So um, I don't think anybody knows of uh, that in terms of the shear thickening behavior with inertia. Um, it, you know, it, if you it, if you forget about shear thickening for a moment, if you just did scaling, then you have to you should go to a granular regime where it goes like gamma dot squared, just by dimensional analysis, right? So there's got to be some other regime out there at higher shear rates where it, it transitions over, and you have to go. Then there should be an inertial thickening in that sense. I'm thinking in my mind, uh, I, and I know what I know what's in my mind. But you may not know what's in my mind, so I'll show you a picture. Right? So. If you plotted the viscosity of the function shear rate, something like that, for example, right, I'm running out of space here, right? As I'm increasing uh, shear rate in this direction, going up, <coughs> if I start to get inertia present, it's got to scale differently. So in this representation, it has to start to rise again, right? Because it's got to scale with shear rate in a different fashion, right? So, so there has to be some inertial thickening in a certain sense taking place. It could. No one knows. No one's done this stuff. So how complicated it is to explain It's not complicated at all. Just put it. It's well. Put the inertia in the equations are easy. Then you have to use a different time stepping algorithm because and it's, it's more challenging to resolve the context as well. That's a that's a different thing that you have to be careful about to do that well. But then, in principle, it's not uh, difficult to do at all. But uh, no one's done it. Right, because you can't contact, right? You, you can put a repulsive force between the particles and have no contact. That's perfectly fine, too. For the, to get the, to at, to look at whether it thickens inertially, you, you can do things where they're kept apart by some repulsive force so that contact issue won't be there. You can still ask the questions about that. You would, yeah, you have, you have, yes, you need more like that. Um, you know, in the, when there's brownian motion present, um, you can do a simple, um, just first order integration exactly. scheme because it's random anyway. The next step is random, so it doesn't do you good. To, you get, you don't, you're not allowed to remember what happened before, basically. So, uh, but that's then when you go to uh, with inertia, particularly, you have to worry about you have to worry about both the position and velocity. Now it comes back into play, and you have to worry about that as independent variables. So it's there's more involved. Yes? So do people understand Coxworth's rule? Do people understand Coxworth's rule? Well, what's the definition of understand, right? <laughs> well, we know that it's empirical. Yep. Uh, for some system it's ap it applies, some system it does not. But are there kind of any theories that actually predict Coxworth's rule? From, um, not that I'm aware of any theories, no. Only in the sense that I replace gamma dot and omega. That's it. Um, yeah. You know, Maruchi did some work for polymers, but well, that still doesn't touch. Yeah, yeah. right. No. Other questions? Sir, are the current ex uh, existing experimental reports completely uh, mm, in support of the uh, support that the Stokes number is strictly close to zero, so that it is not responsible for this uh, distinction in the behavior as we go to high tech level? Um, yeah, I think the particle, so uh, the particle size I think is still small enough that the inertia of the particles in fluid is still small, but you're starting to get at high shear rates to get to regimes where the Reynolds number is not uh, that small any longer. I think there are other complications uh, set in because if you're rotating so fast, the material might flow out of the rheometer, and there's other issues which uh, start to play an important role in what goes on there that may be even more important to worry about than starting to have an inertial effect take place. But it is a challenge. Uh, I guess if you, do, if you do cylinders, you're still okay. It's a challenge to do something at high um, Reynolds number or higher, let's say, Reynolds number order one, and measure things and have uniform distribution. So it's a challenge to actually do those kind of uh, experiments.